This time on the Highland Woodworker. Henry O. Studley changed the tune of woodworkers everywhere when his tool cabinet was revealed to thousands. This was the first thing I'd ever seen that I was like, this is, I have actually seen perfection. Now, woodworking masters Christopher Schwarz and Don Williams weigh in on the mystery surrounding this amazing artisan and give us an up-close and personal tour of the jaw-dropping tool cabinet, this time on a very special edition of The Highland Woodworker. Hello, I'm Charles Brock and I'm a Highland Woodworker. I just love coming to Highland Woodworking in Atlanta, Georgia. It's where I get all my fine woodworking tools and my education. Today we've got a special episode of the Highland Woodworker. It's centered around Henry O. Studley and his marvelous tool cabinet and the two masters who tell us his story, Chris Schwarz and Don Williams. Who is H.O. Studley? Let's find out in this moment with a master. Uh, it was fascinating, really. Uh, I wasn't quite sure what to expect when I first saw it, and I was completely blown away by the intricacy of the uh, tool cabinet itself. I saw the fine woodworking poster. It's kind of the famous poster of it that's been around for years, and I always thought it would be neat to see someday, and I just never, I assumed there would be no way that would ever happen, and found out about this in the book that, you know, Chris Schwarz and Don put together, and yeah, I just had to see it. It's everything I hoped it would be. It's beautiful. And just the artistic, you know, sort of components of how he arranged everything in there is just, it's, it's spectacular. The Grand Lodge of Iowa played host to one of the most amazing spectacles of woodworking I have ever seen, the Studley Tool Chest. This masterful work of art was built by one of the most creative and skilled craftsmen the world has, well, never really known. The search to learn more about Henry O. Studley started with these two woodworking icons, Don Williams, a brilliant designer and conservator of all things history, for one of the most prestigious institutions in the world, the Smithsonian, and Christopher Schwarz, a hand tool expert, blogger, journalist, and co-founder at Lost Art Press, a premier publishing house, releasing such books as Chairmaker's Notebook and The Anarchist Tool Chest. Their latest page turner, though, is Virtuoso. Countless hours of research went into finding out the mystery that is H.O. Studley and his tool chest. Let's hear in these master's words what was revealed. Studley was a craftsman, mostly known in the organ and piano trade. His working life was from shortly after the end of the war between the states uh, right up to the, the uh, First World War. So he had a very long career. He worked until he was 80. And he is most associated with two Boston area musical instrument companies, one being Smith and the other being Poole. And he was renowned as a, as a gifted craftsman and artisan. And the phrase that came up when people were describing him is that he was an ingenious mechanic, which simply meant he was a very creative guy we don't know a lot about him at a personal level, but we do know that he came from a family of creative, mechanic, inventor, builder sorts of people. Uh, and we know that he is considered or was considered by his contemporaries to have mastered the woodworking trade in his mid-teens, maybe as early as the age of 15 or 16. And he continued building on that for the next 60 years. In my research going into the book and the exhibit, I could not find a single primary document from his hand. We only have seen actually a couple of signatures of his, one on his will, one on uh, some real estate transactions, and there's a coupon in a sort of tiny little drawer that's got his signature and he wasn't a, a person of our era, so he didn't record his every fervent feeling and, rec and send it off to his circle of friends. 
There's literally no known correspondence from him or to him. There's no contemporaneous descriptions of him as a person. We know that he was a good citizen. We know that he was a, a brilliant craftsman and that's the and a, a very successful real estate speculator. Mm. And that's the end of what we know about him. But we're very hopeful that this book is going to dislodge something. You know, after years of research, I think Don and I are hopeful that we get to revise this yeah. book. Uh, somebody's going to find the study, studly love letters that's not, to his yeah. cabinet, let's hope. But <laughs> You know, as, as I look out five years from now, uh, there are two among many possibilities, both of which would please me to no end. One is that as a historian and researcher, five years from now we look back at this and say, there's really nothing more to learn. We, got we learned it. all there is. Yep. The other option, which would thrill me in a different way, is oh, you guys know nothing about Studley, and here it is. And there's just a floodgate of information about him, about his craft, about some of the tools he used or invented, or some of the things that we really haven't. One of the things we've talked about for five years now is we simply have no craft technology framework for some of the things that he did. Yeah. And I would love to be inundated, and I would love to for me to call Chris or Chris to call me and say, you know, we really have to do a revised edition. The tool cabinet was reputed to have been built when Studley was in his tenure at Pool Piano, which would have put it between roughly 1900 and 1915 or 18, those were the core groups. His years were a little bit longer. At the end of his life, he conveyed it to a family of friends, neighbors, and uh, co-investors, he was a real estate speculator named the Hardwicks, who were his neighbors in Quincy, Massachusetts. It remained in the, in the Hardwick family until the late 1990s when it was purchased by the current owner uh, who was captivated by it as were millions, well millions probably too many, no. tens, of, tens of thousands of people who saw it on magazine covers and presentations. So it's really only had Studley as the owner, he was the maker, the Hardwick lineage, and the current owner. And it's been well cared for all along the way. Coming at it from the analytical world of the material culture, again, all we know about Studley is that tool chest. That's the best psychoanalysis of him we have. And it's clear that the tool chest was made for that collection of tools. It did not evolve over time. It mm -hmm. was made specifically for that collection of tools. You look at it and you have to know that this was somebody, to put it crudely, he was showing off. But when you look at it, he had a lot to show off about. If I could have a conversation with him, I, I suspect, and this is speculation, he would say, this is my marker, see if you can do better. I have to say the biggest aha moment was one that Don really pointed us to, which was almost every tool in that cabinet is, is well worn. The number one is yeah. incredibly worn, showing a lifetime of immense care, which we've analyzed to by magnification. But what was important is the chest isn't that used. It doesn't it doesn't match with the wear, and Don is of the mind that it was it was produced at the end of his career, which I totally agree with, and it was a statement. It was, a, it was an artistic painting and that traveled forward in time with his tools and his genius. During his lifetime, he was ascribed as the person who created this assemblage and built many of the tools. Looking at it, we both analyzed many of the tools, the configurations, the fingerprints, as it were, the stylistic fingerprints, he probably made or modified heavily enough to consider him having made about three dozen of the 250, 275 tools. The rest of the tools were top of the line. Mm -hmm. Somebody asked me today, well, were there any tools that were sort of second tier? Yeah. There wasn't a second tier tool in there. He, he knew quality and he bought quality. I've never seen anything more spectacular. And I have to say the, the photographer Narayan Nayar who, who was the photographer on this project, put it best when he said it's a, a woodworking fractal. 
which is what makes it amazing, is that no matter how close you get, it's even more amazing. Yeah. The closer you get, the closer you get, the closer you get. And you cannot find where you say, ah, and that's where, that's where he failed. Because he's almost not human in a way, but it's amazing. The function of it primarily is inspiration. And I'm not talking about inspiration of doing better joinery, although the joinery in there is, is flawless. I mean, there's a, there's a little drawer that's about this tall, and there, are, there is a hole and two half, half blind dovetails in 3 16 inch stock. And there's, it's, it's almost like they were... They grew together. Done, done by aliens. But <laughs> one of the things that strikes me as, as an observer of it is that I never fail to be inspired by noticing something new every time I look at it. Sometimes it's I'm looking at it at a particular angle and I see a new composition. And the whole premise of compositional comfort is something I think a lot of our contemporary woodworkers, a lot of the woodworkers that I know are not comfortable with, with striking out into the world of aesthetic composition. Mm -hmm. The first vignette of it, and it's, it's really a, a collage of vignettes, are, are the set of four custom-made awls just to the left of the center line with a graduated set of niches of Gothic arches. And I've been working on artworks at a reasonably high level of conserving artworks for almost 40 years. And I cannot say I've ever seen a more beautiful composition than that assemblage around those things. And Chris can tell you, I, he, he would, I would just stand there and stare at this this set of niches because it is so aesthetically flawless. I like the mallet and you like the mallet. I like the mallet too. Right? <laughs> <laughs> mallet is, speaks to me on so many levels and it's so beautiful and there's nothing out there I've ever seen like it. It's my favorite individual tool is yeah, that you, mallet. Okay, yeah. Good one. And then uh, his, his number one uh, plane in the vignette you know in the, in, alcove, in the yeah. alcove is like genius it's like hair stands up on the back of my neck I'd say that I've traveled all over the world and every woodworking project I ever saw had some flaw some disappointment and this was the first thing I'd ever seen that I was like this is I've, I've actually seen perfection the challenge for me as both a woodworker as an artisan uh, as a researcher into this is is does this collection inspire me to become a better artist or does it inspire me to give it up altogether because I can never measure up? And there's, that's a balancing act. For the moment, you know, I'm, I'm aspiring to become better at art and craft and hopefully I'll never get to the point where Studley is such a towering presence that I say, I can never measure up because I can't but I can measure up to something. And whether I make his work or not, but it is my ardent goal, and I approached Chris about this when we first talked about the project five years ago, is that my ultimate goal is to inspire artisans to step outside their comfort zone and do things that are bolder, more beautiful, more virtuous, and in the case of the book title, approach virtuosity. And then you open it up, and there's more tools underneath there. Don Williams gives us a white glove tour of the Studley tool cabinet. But first, Christopher Schwarz gets to the bottom of those tricky dovetails on Pop Woods tips, tricks, and techniques. You're watching The Highland Woodwork. Moment with the Master is presented by Triton Precision Power Tools. We're kind of a hub for all these different craftsmen that we um, build a team for each specific job. And our work is very much a hybrid of all these different trades. So architecture, furniture, children's playgrounds, 
big public art projects, exhibition builds, and then all sorts of random, unusual things. I'm William Hardy, and I'm the sort of main director and the founder of Studio Hardy. I'm just an average, down-to-earth woodworker. On a scale of one to 10, I'm probably about a five. But one place I score a perfect 10 is right here, and I plan on keeping all 10. That's why I have a saw stop table saw, and there's more. Plenty of power, superior dust collection, and absolute accuracy. These features have made it the best selling cabinet saw in America. Let Highland Woodworking help you put a saw stop in your shop. Craig, from the first cut to the final assembly, providing woodworkers with products that help simplify woodworking challenges. Craig. Forest, manufacturer of the award-winning Woodworker 2 presents the PVW Blade, designed specifically for the rip and cross-cutting of plywood and plywood veneers without splintering or chip outs. Highland Woodworking has been a leader in woodworking education for over 30 years. They offer all kinds of woodworking classes year-round, ranging from how to hand cut dovetails and mortises to how to sharpen a plane or a chisel, how to build a cabinet, a chair, or a bookcase, or how to turn a wooden bowl. There are classes on wood finishing, French polishing, and even antique furniture restoration. For a list of upcoming classes that may interest you, go to highlandwoodworking.com. Later in the show, Don Williams will give us a unique tour of Studley's tool cabinet. But first, Chris Schwarz switches roles from publisher to woodworker and gives us some good advice on tackling dovetails, this time on Popular Woodworking's tips, tricks, and techniques. Chris Schwarz, I tell you, you have taught a whole lot of people how to uh, cut dovetails. I do pretty well till I'm ready to put the boards together and, mm -hmm. and take my marking knife and then it's kind of just a jumble and how do you get it straight and true so that the dovetails come out right? Yeah, well Chuck, you know, the number one problem that people have when they cut dovetails is, you know, they're okay with the, the sawing, they're okay with the chiseling, that's not the problem. The problem is exactly what you point out, which is that transfer point where you take you know, one joint, mm -hmm. either it's the tails or the pins, whichever you cut first, doesn't matter, and transferring that onto the second uh, board. And you know, as you just said, you know, the things shift all around and you're just, uh, you, you can't get it right. And, you know, when a small piece like this, not so big a deal. Most people can manage this, but when you're talking about an 18 or a 24 sure. inch wide case, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you're in you're trouble. So, so there are lots of like wheezes or dodges, as the English call it, for, um, for getting around it. And, and some people will cut a shallow rabbit here and, uh, and that works okay, but then you also have to teach beginners how to use a rabbit plane, and what if you don't have a rabbit plane? Sure. Uh, other people will put some blue tape there, and that gives you a little ledge, which makes it easier. But what I found uh, that makes it foolproof, absolutely foolproof, is uh, to bring a ruler into the equation. Mm -hmm. So I have these, you know, these are hardware store rulers that you'll get, and you can even use paint sticks. But I use a ruler because this is, uh, well, because of uh, David Charlesworth's ruler trick, I like to call it the American ruler trick. So you just take the ruler and on the inside, press it down on the baseline and then just put a couple taps in with some escutcheon pins or something like that. Mm -hmm. And now you can't fail. I mean, you can't, uh, it just comes in here and boom, it's like, it just locks in like that. So uh, now you can simply- You've taken the juggling out. Oh yeah, there's no juggling, there's no corner clamps, there's no anything. Yeah. And, if you, and if, you, if, you, if it moves, you can come right back and get to it. So we'll just take a little knife to line up the two edges 
and then it's uh, just no problem to come in and just make those uh, marks and that transfer. Uh, the only downside to this trick is, of course, that you know you have a couple little pinholes on the uh, inside of your your tailboard. But you know I've been doing this for years, and and no one has noticed yet. So I'm. I, nobody I, has seen your nobody pinholes. Said my, nobody said <laughs> those pinholes. Oh, I got gotcha. you. Uh, so this, this trick works with pins first or tails first, half wind dovetails, uh, whatever you want. It doesn't matter how you cut dovetails, but this little ruler trick will make sure that you, uh, you, you get that transfer point just right. And it right. costs almost nothing. Well, yeah, they cost especially nothing if you go to, you know, home center and steal the paint sticks. Sure. You got a little support here and kind of a standard way I saw that you set it up with your, yeah. with your plane underneath. Oh yeah. This is just, I mean, I cut dovetails. Every project involves dovetails mm -hmm. and I cut them all by hand. So I have a, you know, the, I have a special vice and, and a special support here just to make my life easier. So I, it's less to think about so I can focus on cutting the dovetails. Hey. Sounds good to me, I can't wait to try. All right, well thanks Chuck. Yeah. All right. Look at the rope edge carving right. molding there. You've learned about the man behind this marvelous tool cabinet. When we come back, a tour of this amazing work of functional art. You're watching The Highland Woodworker. Introducing the ultimate blush trim rounder bit by Whiteside. Get CNC quality cuts from your patterns every time. Whiteside, industrial grade and American made. Rikon Power Tools, a leader in woodworking power tools for over 10 years with a passion for quality and performance at an affordable price. Rikon has a full line of dependable tools, including a long list of industry leading band saws like their powerful 10 351 14-inch professional. Rikon Power Tools, tools designed by woodworkers. Are your tools Tormek sharp? Tormek, consistent, reliable, and razor sharp. Tormek, sharpening innovation. If you can't make it to Atlanta, then you can always shop us on the web at www.highlandwoodworking.com. Well, earlier in the show, we learned all about who Henry O. Studley was and got a glimpse of his phenomenal tool cabinet. Now. Don Williams takes us on an exclusive tour. Well, they're all highlights, but take us to the, through the highlights of okay. the chest. One of the, one of the construction technique highlights, if you will, or the way he organized his tools, is the fact that many of these are on movable panels that, that uh, flip up and you can look behind them and see varying tools at multiple depths. And for example, you've got this amazing, exquisite little Prentice jeweler's vise mounted to a small slab of Santo Domingo mahogany, the whole of which hangs in its own stirrup back here, along with precision tools. Uh, this is a piece that he made. These are some Starrett or other measuring tools completely hidden from sight to the casual observer and yet when you lay this down you see yet another layer and what you probably couldn't see is in the back you see this, this blade of, a, of a, a protractor square that's completely hidden hung on the back side of this so you don't really get to appreciate it and then you can move to a panel like this which includes my favorite vignette this is this right here is as beautiful as, as human art gets, in my mind. It's flawless in its, its design and its execution. You have, again, uh, really the best tools that were available. He didn't buy anything that wasn't the best tool. He didn't make anything that wasn't the best tool. So there was a real key for that. And yet you can lift this up, and some of the tools are a little bit um, 
quirky about the way they stay or don't stay in place and that you look underneath and there's another layer and then you can remove that and there's another layer behind that, behind both of these. So the, uh, the real takeaway from all of this is the depth and three-dimensionality of it. You've got these planes, uh, you've got his, his insignia of, of Masonic iconography, he was a very loyal Mason. And then yet you open it up, and there's even stuff back there. And some, a lot of people think that that sharpening stone box is the single most beautiful thing in here. And again, it, it, beauty is in the eye of the beholder to some degree. It is a beautiful thing. Sure. It's not, it's not the thing that really captures, uh, captures me, but that's okay. I think it's an exquisite thing. You come down here to drawers. You can see a drawer here that's, again, multiple layers, including sliding tills for screws and then French fit tools, two layers of French fit tools underneath it. This Amazing. Is, there's, there's nothing here that's accidental. Now, I don't know about your shop, but sometimes in my shop, a tool is just hanging where it was most convenient to put a nail. That's right. Uh, yeah. Again, I'm not speaking for your shop, I'm speaking for mine. I thought you had been to my shop. There, there, there was none of that here. None of that here. And you see a little drawer like this where the dovetails are almost too small to see when he cut them. And again, it's all planned out. I will say that some of these little drawers spoke to me of the humanity of Studley the deepest. And why? Because there are bits of broken tools in there that he couldn't bear to throw away. And I don't wow. know if that's a problem you have, but sometimes I have tools that break I can't bear to see them thrown away. So I'll keep them in that drawer in the Kennedy toolbox until a time comes when I can use that thing. We have drawers full of fitted tools here on both sides. Uh, we come around here to his uh, back saws with hanging specialized tools on, on every side with, with support brackets, you know, a wonderful uh, bevel gauge, brace, fitted measuring devices of one kind or another. I know a terrific uh, caliper with an exquisite ivory and, and a mother of pearl mount. And it's it's way beyond needed. I mean, one definition of art is something that is made more lovely than it needs to be. This was art. You've got uh, chisels that fit by, the hand goes way up into a closet above and then you can retract it. And yet there's a slot for the chisel going way down. Uh, again, wow. an, another top panel of tools. This is a movable panel. This is my favorite individual tool right here. It's a, the mallet. It's an infill cast head mallet. There's, yeah. a, there's a beach infill block that goes all the way through it. And when you when you look at it, let's see if we can't take it out and take a look. But you can see that this is a beach block that goes all the way through. This is some of the most remarkable metal casting I've ever seen. This was cast as a one-piece shell with all of these details in double Bombay with virtually no handwork finishing. This is pretty much as it came out of the sand when it was cast. And there's more tools underneath there. Wow. And then you open it up and there's more tools underneath there. Wow, so collection of augers. There, was, uh, there was an insight, if not a downright genius, to the whole creative process, both aesthetically and technically, to lay this all out so that every part fits together. If a tool is out of place, the doors won't close or the next layer won't close. So everything wow. has to be perfect. And this was in a time before computer-aided design. This all had to be worked out exactly as it is now. This was something that burst fully formed from his creativity. And so when he started making this, he was making this exact thing with no changes whatsoever. You can see those That's details. Just amazing. Look at, look at the rope edge carving, right. molding there. And then we can move up to the left a little bit and you see this detail of the pendant of the alcove which was, which was Masonic iconography for the number one. And it's fitted, and I can tell you, you can only appreciate that under a microscope. 
Wow. At least I can only appreciate it under a microscope, and I have had a microscope up to it to take a look at it. That is, that is workmanship. And then when you come down here and look at these arches and the tapered bevels on either side of those half Gothic arches made with a single stroke of a knife, that is a craftsman who is supremely confident in what he's doing. Oh, beautiful. And it is, in my experience, the only number one I've ever seen with honest wear on it. Every other number one is basically just a, a watch fob or something like that. I'm exaggerating, but it's, it's a tool. This was used, and you can see that it was used and it was sharpened. It was so much more than isn't that cute. It yeah. is so much more than isn't it cute, and it had a particular task. It's a tool that's way too small for my hand. I couldn't use this. Uh, but he did, and it fit right in, right in here, and just slid, slid home, and stayed put. And I'm just trying to share my obsession about this with, with the other people that will be inspired, inspired to try new things, and maybe inspired to try better things, which is how I'm trying to use it for myself. Let it inspire me to do better work. Thank you so much, my friend, Thanks, for sharing Charles. this with the world. It's good to see you. For more information about H.O. Studley, I would recommend this book, Virtuoso. Pick one up at Highland Woodworking in Atlanta or online at highlandwoodworking.com. Improve your woodworking experience. Sign up for Wood News Online, a monthly newsletter showcasing the latest news, tips, and classes Highland Woodworking has to offer. By signing up, you'll receive the latest episode of The Highland Woodworker, special store promotions, and Wood News Online delivered straight to your inbox. Sign up today. Well, that's all the time we have for this special episode of The Highland Woodworker. Don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And until next time, I'm Charles Brock, and I'm a Highland Woodworker. Thank you.